what happened is that a week ago I was praying. I was praying after uh, having been inspired a few things. And back in, I think, in December, I wrote an article called, um, How Did This Happen? And really it was looking at the greater home education community in light of what had transpired with the, the Trinity wisdom thing and, and looking at it in, in a much broader perspective and, and coming to the conclusion that, that the home education world that, that we're here, that is here today, is not the home education world that Faye and I started in a long, long time ago. Things seem to have morphed. And so when I got thinking and praying and writing about it, I came to the conclusion that what's happened is that we've kind of invented something that I had escaped when I started home educating my children back in the late 80s. I was part of the public education system. I was a high school teacher. I really didn't like what was going on there because what I saw happening at the school level, not so long time ago, that's over 30 years ago, um, or nearly 30 years ago, is that the students were the last thing on the agenda. <coughs> we had actually created an industry, and it was, it was just the education industry. And back then, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember, but uh, the Alberta Teachers Association had a slogan then that said, Public Education Works, which I found quite interesting because Public education works as kind of an incomplete <coughs> sentence, which is a bit of an embarrassment for teachers union. But, but at the same time, I started asking questions. It's a statement, but I think it's fair to ask, where does it work? When does it work? How does it work? And all I would get was blank stares. And then finally I came to my own conclusion and simply said, well, it's a multi-billion dollar industry that works for pretty well everyone except for students and caring teachers. I mean, it was, it was a pretty strong statement to make. And when we, we started home educating, it was great. It was wonderful because what was happening is that we were fellowshipping with, with fellow travelers whose focus was on the children. They wanted what was best for their children. They were willing to give up a job for their children. They were willing to, to pull out the children from the school. No funding, no help, and a lot of persecution, depending on where you were. We were okay because I was a teacher in the system that we were in, but a lot of other people didn't have that. There was a real camaraderie. There was a, a real union, a real you know, collection of people that seemed to have a, a, a common purpose, a, a common goal, a common motive. And, and it, it was great. It was, it was a community. And, and what I loved about it is it was so different from the industry that I was a part of as a high school teacher. <coughs> so it was refreshing, it really was. Well, after this wisdom trinity thing took place here in the, in the fall, I started taking a real hard look at it and I was very, very frustrated, actually very discouraged at the fact that I, I come to the conclusion that we had developed a, a whole new industry. And it, it's, it was much the same as the public school uh, industry, but only different. And you gotta remember that the problem with that is that is that the people that, that matter were, were, were the last one on the list of who was important. And so I got looking at that, didn't like it. And then when I saw some of the people who were running for the board on it, I got very, very concerned about that. And I wrote another article, I don't know if any of you have read it, but it was on the website, and it was simply entitled, What Has uh, Ahia Become? Now, you know, before we go any further, I should say that this evening is not about, you know, a witch hunt. This is not here, you know, the, uh, a something bashing event or, or anything like that, I got thinking that there's, there's an even greater problem. You see, when we're looking at the creation of the industry, when we're looking at some of the issues, some of the issues that are uh, present in, in, in Ahia, we're missing something. And what we're missing is that we're actually focusing on the symptom and completely missing the problem. You see, if there's no problem, then there's no symptoms. But if there's symptoms, there's a problem. And this is a common human failing, isn't it? We just kind of uh, start focusing on trying to fix the symptoms. And they keep showing up in different ways and means. And, and yet, we, we, we haven't addressed what's, what's causing it in the first place. So that's what I was hoping to do. So I wrote another article that just went up two days ago, I think. And basically, it's kind of the third of the trilogy. And it was just simply uh, entitled, well, What About Home Education? And see, the thing is, is that a lot of us don't even know what's going on. We're, we're, we're just, we're just well, I'm not going to say clueless. We're busy <laughs> raising children. We're busy making a living. We haven't got time to get into the nitty gritty. Me, I, I eat, breathe, live this stuff. This is, this is 
the things that I do all the time. And, and I, I'm looking at it and I'm afraid that if we continue on the path that we are presently on, that perhaps maybe that train is about to derail. And my concern, I mean, I'm old enough to quit, right? But I'm not. My children are all grown up, but you know, they're grown up enough to have children of their own. That makes me really, really concerned about where home education is going. This is about our grandchildren. It's about our children and our grandchildren and them as well. If we continue to compromise a little here and compromise a little bit there, one day you wake up and you ask yourself, how did we get here? What, what exactly transpired? How, how, what did we do wrong? Nothing really. <coughs> just didn't see what was going on. And it, it happened around us. So there's a creation of an industry. And that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. I just wanted to say, well, what's it all about? So I'm going to, I'm going to end there. I, I'm going to introduce a few people. I brought, brought Dr. Michael Wagner along. He's going to answer all the questions that you have for him, right? He's a little bit nervous, so we'll, we'll get him up. I've got Gary back there, and uh, he's, he's going to answer some questions. I brought along also uh, Brian Colwell. Um, if you haven't heard of Brian Colwell, then you haven't been listening to the news. Um, he has a way of getting himself in there. <laughs> but uh, it's because there's some people who are actually standing up, and, and that's the thing. I, I want to tell you one more story. And that is that uh, Faye and I had a kind of an interesting birthday this year, and we, we took off and went on a little bit of a, of a, of a vacation, but it was actually a, a soul-searching mission. It was just asking ourselves, why, why are we still doing this? And I've already answered that. It's for our grandkids, and it's for the fact that we, there's no such thing as retirement. You, you know that, right? As long as the Lord has got something for us to do, we need to do it. The other thing, too, that we started looking at is that there's far and away too many examples in our own lives and in the lives of people collectively, especially as Christians, where we figure, you know what, it, it's not worth dying on this hill. This is such a small thing, Let, let's just ignore it, let's just leave it go. So what happened is that we, we get off the airplane, we get on a taxi, and the taxi we knew was supposed to cost $12.50, and when we got delivered to where we are supposed to go, the guy says, you owe me 25 bucks. We were tired, you know, jet lag, all that kind of stuff. Everything's new. So I gave him the 25 bucks. And later on, the people that we were staying with said, well, he kind of double charged you there. I said, really? Yeah. He says, it's 12 and a half bucks. That's all it is. Oh, well, how many people are going to make a big stink about 12 and a half bucks? Is it worth it? No, not at all. It isn't worth it. Far easier for me to say, forget it. He can have it. Hope he enjoys it. We had an excellent experience and it turns out that the only thing about that whole trip so far that was negative was this was taxi experience and and I, and I just couldn't let it go and I'm not one for that I mean, twelve and a half dollars see you later bye but this one bugged me and it bugged me and it bugged me because what Faye and I were getting more than anything else is that we have to start righting some wrongs right? so what I did then is I, I I had his card. He was kind of a silly. I, he asked me, I asked him if he was interested in the day-long thing. The thing is, he had a big crucifix on him. So I said, oh, you must share the faith, you know. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, after a while, I was, going, I was thinking maybe I'd phone him and ask him exactly who was hanging on the cross, because there was a Christ and there was a couple of thieves, too. You remember that? So, <laughs> so, so what I did then is I, I just simply uh, had his card, I had his number, and just before we, 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 we left, I decided to phone the fellow, <laughs> and I told him, I said, John, I don't know if you remember me. I said, but you kind of double charged me, and he says, okay, where do you live? Oh, I said, I don't have a clue. But I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you the number of the, the guy we're, we're staying with. We were staying in Airbnb, and, and, and he'll tell you. But I guess I might have got a little scared there because uh, when he punched in that number, it turns out to be a well-known uh, lawyer <laughs> from the country. So he, uh, he did come, and he, done, he not only gave me my, my, my 12 and a half bucks, back, but he gave me the whole thing. He gave me the full $25 in exchange for his card. He would ask me, we, you know, can I have my card back? And, and, and I had absolutely no idea the power that I had in my hand in that little tiny piece of paper. You see, one phone call to the airport authority and that guy would have been unemployed. And in that country, uh, you know, if, you're, if you've got a taxi place in the airport, it's probably because your father had one. All right? There's, there's no getting it. Now, I got my 25 bucks back and I just gave it to the lawyer because he did all the work anyways. 
and um, gave him back his card. But you know, did I do what, what, what I did? Was that wrong? Was was that you know? You know what happens? A lot of times we simply say, "Well, aren't you being vengeful?" Or you know, no. I was writing a wrong, and was the motivation over the twelve dollars and fifty cents? I'll tell you what I did though. That guy is going to think twice before he rips off the next guy. And that's, you know, the moral of the story is, is that we do need to right wrongs. There's no room for vengeance here because vengeance would have been if I would have phoned that airport authority, I would have caused that man some harm. That's not our place. But we do need to right wrongs. And you can only right those wrongs if you know what those wrongs are. So <coughs> we're looking forward to just discussing, answering some questions and so on this evening. And it's not going to be a me show. It's going to be a uh, whoever wants to talk show. And so uh, with that, I think I'm going to simply open the floor to questions. Yes, sir. Can you give us some parallels of what you've seen 30 years ago to what's happening now? Okay. Parallels. Can, I have to repeat the question, right? Can you give me some parallels to what you were seeing 30 years ago to what you are seeing now? Well, first of all, the entire uh, convention of 30 years ago was held actually in this building, and it, it occupied one room. That was it. There was a few tables along the edge of people who were, who were selling, but essentially it was a real community. It seemed like we all had a common objective, we all had a common purpose, and we had a common enemy. Okay? That, that was the, 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 the thing that I really enjoyed. And of course, it seemed like everyone's focus was, was on what was best for the children. But more importantly than that, is there anything more important than what's best for the children? No. It's, it's the bottom line. Why are we doing this? Why are we home educating? Is it because we want to somehow best the school? Well, I got news for you. A better bad is still bad. Okay? That wasn't it. Our focus was that we saw clearly that what we were there to do was to serve the Lord, that we were answering a call that all of us as parents had, that it was our authority, not the government's, and that we were the ones responsible for the training and the teaching of our children. And that was a focus. We could count on that. Now, I'm not sure that's the focus anymore. We've certainly been involved in it for a long, long time, and I'll tell you, I mean, we can, we can tell you another little story too, I guess, and this is the, maybe I will. It keeps coming back, so maybe I should really tell the story. How many of you have ever read Randy Alcorn's book, uh, um, um, Safely, Home. Safely Home? Yeah. Well, I actually had heard this story before I read the book. So whether it's a real story or, or, or not is another, you know, is, 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 is besides the point. But w what in it, the, this is uh, uh, situated in communist China, okay, and I, I, I'm a, I am answering your question here. It's situated in communist China, so let's say communist China or even communist Russia, okay, where it is illegal to have any kind of an assembly of any kind to, you know, that, that, that's Christian. It's illegal to carry a Bible. It's illegal to have anything to do with God. Can you see the, the, the scene? We have a group such as this that is now gathered clandestinely, you know, at dark and maybe in some dark basement or something, and they're all worshiping the Lord and, and praising the Lord, and all of a sudden, the door bursts open, and, you know, half a dozen soldiers step in. And they say, you know what? What you guys are doing here is illegal. It's against the law. You know, I might even pull out the little red book or whatever and read out of it, whatever the case may be, to point that out. And they said, you know what? And we have full permission, he said, to just put an end to this right here and now. He said, now, if you're not prepared to, to die for this faith of yours, for this, this Christ of yours, you better leave. Guess what? There's some that left. Yeah. So then he gets really, really serious about that. And he goes, you know, <laughs> it's going to be even more serious than that because we actually have permission to take you in. And you'll probably end up in jail. So if you're not prepared to go to jail for this, Jesus is yours, you, you better leave now. And guess what? A few more do. And then finally he says, actually, <laughs> truth is, is we can shoot you. <laughs> We've got that power. So unless you're ready to get shot, 
I suggest you leave. Okay? Can, you, can you see yourselves here right now? Would you leave? Okay. Well, in the end, he said, there's a line down the middle over here. He says, and I said, we got some on the left and we got some on the right. So he says, I'll tell you what. He says, everybody that's on the right is going to get shot. Okay? And uh, if you want to get shot, then you better move to the right side. And if you're on the left side, well, we're going to shoot you anyways. So what's going to happen? Are the people going to move from the left to the right? No. What, what are they going to do? They're going to leave. Yeah, they're gone. Well, it's a crazy story. Could that happen today? Could that, could that happen here in Canada? Or maybe should I reword that? Is maybe we're already kind of sort of there in lots of ways? So that's what's changed. What's changed is that back then, if somebody would have come in and said, all right, you cannot home educate. It's against the law. You know what we'd have done? We'd have all walked out and said, have a good day. We, we, we would not have given that up. How many people would continue to home educate today as an example if all of a sudden there was some degree that said that we don't have any money or that we're not going to be paying? So that's a really important question to ask. Why are we home educating? What I think, by and large, you know, this is very much a generality, there's a lot of people who have lost sight of that. Why are we doing this? And it better not be because you want to outdo the schools, because that's not what we want to do. So what's happened is, as a consequence of that, the money has gone in, and we have divided. Today, we are just like the Christian church, divided in a thousand different denominations. You know, except in the home school, we're divided along different sectarian lines. I am this organization, I'm of that organization, this organization, and so on. What actually fuels that industry? It would be the money. And who's got that money? The parents have that money. So we wanted to say, well, let's have a look and see. Are, are, have we forgotten our first love? Have we forgotten why we're doing this? Have we? Because I know there's a lot, just there's agencies and organizations out there that are focused entirely on the money and how they can get more of it. As an example, Alberta is the only one that is actually funded. Uh, BC is a little bit, but it's all tied to public programming. What would happen in this province right now if the money was attached to public programming? In other words, you can only take government money if and only if you are prepared to do the public programming. How many people would actually continue to take the money and do the public programming? So then the, that begs the question, <laughs> what were we escaping 30 years ago? that very public programming. We were escaping it. We were running away from it. As a matter of fact, to even suggest such a thing was, for all intent and purpose, anathema. Like, what? Why would we do that? And we only had a choice of maybe, I don't know, half a dozen different you know, curricula that we could have used back then. We sure didn't have the you know, plethora of stuff that's available today. But we would never have gone back there. Today, the line down the middle, the difference between the right side and the left side, is so blurred that people don't know when they're leaving home education and getting back into school and back and forth. We actually are taking advantage of the fact that the vast majority of the people who are coming into home education are, are coming from a school background. The only thing that they truly understand is school. So it's far, far better to prey on their misunderstanding, to provide them with a, um, you know, a, a facsimile of school than it is to turn around and to say, actually, there's a different way to do things. That's how it's changed, in my opinion. Another question. I was afraid of that. Oh, all right. How did the funding ever start up again? Because I think that that's about it. I'm sure most people in the room know. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain of that, because quite frankly, that's what I thought. You know, I'd be kind of preaching to the choir. But um, when, when it the, the funding was always there. When we were registering back when we started, you had no choice but to register with your local school board. And the local school board just simply said, fine, okay, go home. But they were putting in for the full funding. All right? So as if, as if the children were physically in the school. 
Then what happened is that um, in 1988, when the School Act was passed, the, uh, you know, <laughs> this is where Mike should come in, but uh, in 1988, when the School Act was, was passed, it said that you had to register, but it actually did not say that you had to register with any particular board, uh, you know, the, the, your local board or otherwise. So that actually created the beginning of the problem. So what they did then is they created the first thing. It's a phenomenon that's only unique to Alberta. It's called borderless, borderless students. See, if, where you live, if you're going to send your children to school, it's usually within the borders, you know, reasonable driving distance. If you happen to have a, a private school in that area, you can use that. If not, then you're forced to choose between a public school or a separate school, if, if you've got that. So that's what happened. And then the, at the same time in the early 90s, w the government was starting to amalgamate school boards. And there was a, a, a few of them there, and they were, they were Catholic school boards that were just not interested in being a part of a, of a greater jurisdiction. And one in particular was in Vermilion. And so uh, when it was first done, everyone knew that you could do that, but they, they were kind of loath to, to pilfer students from other jurisdictions. But when these, these uh, little uh, Catholic schools realized that they, they, it was a do or die for them, they, they saw this as a survival uh, opportunity. So they started to appeal uh, to the, 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 the parents to say, well, register with us and finish the sentence, and we will give you money. Okay? And then this one, yeah, well, we'll give you this, and then we'll give you this. And that's when I got into trouble with uh, here the first time. I, I actually went out there and I was saying, don't do that, don't touch this, this is dangerous, this is going to lead us down the wrong path. And I got a personal phone call from the president to tell me to cease and desist and mind my own business. I've been making that noise ever since. You see, it's money that's evil, right? The love of money. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's not money at all. That's just kind of an inanimate piece of junk, a little piece of paper. You can burn it. You can do whatever you want with it. It's how you handle it. That's what makes the difference. And so in the beginning, it wasn't such a big deal. But boy, I was, I, it, it split. We lost friends over this. We really did. Uh, you know, and, and good friends. They, they, they took off and went with the money. And then, of course, it uh, got to the point where these, these outfits were starting to show up in the uh, AHIA convention. And there was even stories that they, there were kids that were being given 50 bucks for bringing people to their booth kind of thing so they can sell them on, on, on joining that particular organization. I mean, that's rumor. I don't know if it, was for, for, you know, if it actually happened. Then in, I believe, 94, that's how the government leveled it. Okay, but 1994, then the government said, hold it, hold it, just a minute here. You guys are getting paid full base funding for students that are not even in the classroom. Okay. So they said, that's it, 25% of base, and, um, and half of it has to go to the parents for the purchase of, of materials. And that's where blended programming was invented. You see, the schools that were involved, they were used to bringing students in and getting the full funding. 25% means that your income just got cut by 75%. Are you following? So very simple now. They figured, what are we going to do now? So a uh, particular fellow, and uh, there's another thing about tonight. We, we can use names. Okay, that's fine. A fellow by the name of Brady Long. Uh, I really had a lot of respect for him. He's quite resourceful. He went to the government and he asked him, he says, well, we got a problem here. He says, we've got some students that are actually in school half the time, but they're at home the other half of the time. What do you propose to do about that? And so the government, rightly so, said, well, I guess that would mean half of the regular funding and, and half of the homeschool funding. Okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? And that was the beginning of blended programming. Then, of course, you know, money could really cause some people to be very, very resourceful. <laughs> What they did is they got thinking, well, do they have to actually physically be in the school? There was this kind of new technology on the scene then called computers, and there was this other <coughs> really, really neat thing. I think you can find it in the museum that was called a fax. Um, you know, and, and then there was, uh, there was this thing called the Internet, which was ugh, pretty bad, but it was the start of it. So by virtue of the child being connected to the school by phone or by fax or by Internet, then they were physically in the school. So right from the beginning, blended programming was very, very much um, uh, suspect. It would, it, it, it was, in, in my opinion, it was quite fraudulent. 
And it continued to be until uh, I finally got vindicated on that last year when the, the uh, um, Curtis um, Clark, what's, what's, his, what's his title? Deputy, Deputy, Min Minister. Deputy Minister put an end to it. Hallelujah. Because there was a lot of stuff that shouldn't have been happening. Now, back to the money. So that's where the 25% came in. And you know what? Everybody took it. We all thought, hey, that's our share of the taxes that we're paying, so what's the big deal? It's not really a big deal. I'm not going to get into an argument there, I guess, if that's how you feel. But the problem is, is that because of the fact that there was money involved, agencies started to be created <coughs> whose job it was, at first, whose job it was to, to help these schools who really didn't understand home education. Okay? They were, they were third party. And the things that we were doing back then is amazing. That we actually all got away with it because we were part of that as well. Is where you go up to a school and say, hey, give me your authority and I'll take care of all this for you. And the school was happy to do it. Just give them a percentage or whatever and the school was, was okay with that. Really, we know today that that was probably not the right thing to do, but that's what was happening. And so after a while, what happens? How do, wh why, do, why do these organizations continue? What's their focus? We lose the original focus, that it was supposed to be there for the welfare of the, of the students. Just like the public education works. For who? I don't know. <laughs> the first answer should have been immediately, well, it obviously works for, for students, but they, they, they couldn't even answer that. And so we lose our focus on why we were there originally and sort of morph into something else. And then, of course, what really spawned the whole thing is that this, this rather unfortunate incident in the fall, what, what broke my heart is that throughout all of this, it seemed like it was right back to where it was before. Public education works for everybody as part of the industry except for the students. And so here, this was working, sure. But I found that you know, <coughs> agencies would come along and they would give a whole bunch of explanations and so on. And I, oh, by the way, this is about the kids. And I found that all of a sudden that the home educators were now charged with defending the industry as if we depended on the industry. I, I thought the industry was actually dependent on the home educators. So that's what really spawned a lot of this, is simply saying, whoa, I think we've lost our focus. I think we've lost our vision. What is it that we're supposed to be doing? Well, <laughs> my job is not to defend any particular organization or any particular portion of the industry. Personally, I'd just as soon see the industry disappear and get back to the focus of why it was there. I mean, I'm gonna ask you a question. Just think about it for just a very few seconds. Why did you decide to home educate? It is my sincerest hope that the answer that you came up with right away is because in obedience to God, he instructed us. It's our, it, 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 it's not our right, <laughs> sorry. It's our responsibility. It's our God-given responsibility. And where we are today, back then we didn't have a problem. We knew that I was the boss, I'm in authority, this is my family, and we were ready to duke it out with anybody who was going to argue with us. Today, we're more than happy to declare a placard that says, God gives me the authority over the education of my children, and I expect the government to pay for it. There's a confusion here. Who is in authority? You can't, you can't serve two masters. It's one or the other. That's how it's changed. Yeah. Okay, what's the question again? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. So here in this room we understand who the enemy is. Okay, and who is the enemy? Uh, money, the <laughs> Satan above all. Yeah, okay, right. You've got to remember that nothing is completely bad, but Satan is nothing is completely perfect but Christ. Okay, is that, that clear? There's a, a war of good against evil. Yep. Of which we're a part of it. Yeah. But I come out of the same system that I also want to fight now, right? Right. Somebody showed me, invited me, and I said, it makes sense. That's biblical. That's mm -hmm. how we yeah. have to do it. Yeah. But many people have lost sight of that, or they're not being instructed, honestly. There's, that's the problem. That's right. You see. But 
How do you, how do we forward this? Well, <laughs> it, it, it's we, we take back the control that we had in the first place. We, we did not get that control stolen from us. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be gracious here. We actually relinquished it a little bit at a time until one day we woke up and said, hey, who's driving this thing? Okay? And that's what happened to me. I'm, I'm looking at this. I'm going, who is driving this? Why do we have an industry here? You know? I mean, I, I really, really get upset when children are evaluated in the terms of how much they're worth. Okay? That, there, there's something wrong with this picture. And, you know, we, the, the, the number of kids times the number of money, and so it, it, it gets really ugly. So, yeah, first of all, we're not going to blame anybody. So secondly, the number one enemy is, as you pointed out, is this called ignorance, okay? Which is not a bad word. It just simply means you don't know. How many people really truly understand? I mean, I get, like I said, to think about this all the time. But, you know, how many of you dads while you're driving, you know, the tractor in the field or whatever are thinking about, you know, what, what this is all about? So the, the, the enemy is most definitely Satan. And it's not money in and of itself. It's people who are misusing that money because they come, as I, I said, said before, mostly with their school background. Every one of us end up believing that we're, tr you know, we're right. You, you know the three rules of worldview, don't you? Uh, everyone has one, okay? Uh, everyone's worldview is corrupted because we're in a corrupted world, and everybody thinks that their worldview is perfect. It's just natural. We all, we all right away think that, that we know what's going on. But a worldview is everything that we've experienced. So if all you've experienced is school and you bring your children home, guess what you do? How many of you remember playing school, getting a little desk and you had a school room and a chalkboard and everything else? Okay? We used to play school as children and sometimes as adults we do as well. Why? Are we being stupid? It's all we know. <coughs> what does the Bible say? How will they know unless someone tells them? Somebody has to inform them. But let's take a look at it from the, industry, from the industry eyes. Do you think it's going to pay better dividends to go out of our way to try and explain and teach and encourage parents to put their eyes, fix their eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith? Do you think that it's, it's worth the while to go out there and to show them that there are alternatives to the school system? Do you think it's, it's, it's lucrative for uh, you know, somebody to actually take the time to point out that just about everything within the school system is godless and unbiblical and anti-Christian and secular? You know, to take that home and to Christianize it doesn't, doesn't fix it, okay? What's easier, to do that or to take advantage of the fact that people already are stuck in a school mindset and to offer all kinds of different things for whatever reason. I mean, everybody's got some kind of a program or a plan or something. That's a problem, is that it's a whole lot better, easier to advance the industry than to be involved in ministry. There's a, you know, because there's something that's pushing this. It's temporal. And it's something that we can cash in. It's tangible. We can put it in our hands. We can put it in our pockets. We can, we can do things with it. Ministry is where you pour yourself out. And maybe the best you're going to get is a good kick in the rear end for having pointed it out. So there's no real incentive unless we get back to what it is that we pulled our children out for in the first place. Hold on to it. Yes, sir. Two questions for you, Leo. And one is that the wisdom thing sort of must be clogged up. So just the little bit that I know about it, most people stayed with wisdom. Yep. Even though they were under threat of the government. Right. To me, that was a very hopeful thing. I mean, that proved to me that most of those people that were heard with wisdom, heard with wisdom, they weren't in it for the money. You know that? I don't know that. Mm. I'm, I'm just... I mean, you're talking about ignorance, right? So I'm trying yeah. to learn about this too. Right. That, from the outside, tells me people are interested. They're, they're not doing it for the money. Like, what do we get? 800 bucks a kid? There's not a lot of money, but you know what? It makes a difference when you have homeschool kids. Yeah. But <laughs> the wisdom thing, I think, yeah. showed that a lot of people, you know, I think we can be like the prophet who says, I'm the only one left. 
Right. When there's 3,000 that haven't been there yet. So right. So, you know, that gives me some hope that a lot mm -hmm. of homeschool people, we are doing it for the right reason. we got to encourage each other and, and, you know, lovingly go to these people who are maybe doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Pastor Colwell, I hope I'm saying that correctly, you're a hero of mine because you're in the press, you're standing for what's right, and that gets a lot of the, you know, we just need that match to fire the rest of us up. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of people on middle ground who need that, mm -hmm. okay, I've got some other people standing, you know, and that's, you know, standing up against the GSAs, that has really helped me. We need to, and I can be a little bit more bolder at work, say this is why I believe I'm not going to keep in the system. Right. Well, actually, let me answer the first question first. Please understand that when you address a particular issue, it's the people that make it global. Not everybody is in the same place at the same time. Not everybody is motivated by money. Not everybody is motivated by power. Not everybody is motivated. And not everybody is actually well informed as to why it is that they're supporting a particular cause. As a matter of fact, we all do that, right? I mean, we all support the cause that we're most familiar with without actually looking into what the cause is all about. So there's a lot of people who are indeed really, really sincere in their ignorance. Okay? And, and we're, we're not to fault that. I mean, un, un, unless people are given the, the, uh, the, 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 the direction explained, then, then we go, I mean, the people that, that I've helped out as an example, I don't, I don't try to make anything out of anybody, but I do provide them with the information and ask them the questions. Let them come to their own conclusions. So yes, um, but the problem is, is that it was actually advanced as if we save this portion of the industry, we save home education. I'm saying that there's two different things here. There, there's, there's the home education, all right, and then there is also the industry. If the industry was to disappear, would the home educators disappear? I would say no. If the home educators were to disappear, would the industry disappear? Yes, they would. Okay, so when we look at it from that perspective, we need to just take a good hard look. What are we doing here? Are we putting the cart before the horse or the horse before the cart? And again, that depends on the, on the individual. I was watching all the advertisements that were going out there as an example, and while we're sitting here trying to protect, there was one agency out of Calgary that was advertising that they could take up to 1,000 of these students. I mean, talk about scavengers. There were lots of them out there just going, wow, 3,500. I wonder how many of those I can get, okay? And I... <laughs> I was watching some of that stuff, and on the front, they're going, we're very concerned about the plight for home education. And on the other hand, I'm questioning what's really going on behind that facade. Are they going, man, if I can get a couple, 300 of those times this much money, it means that much money? I don't know. Is that how it went? I don't know. Could it have gone that way? You bet you. Yeah, I'd like to speak in a few moments, too, but just so unclear. So are you advocating two options? Some can have it's going to opt out of funding, and some can. Because I don't, I don't necessarily agree with surrendering our taxes to the ATA and the public schools that want to confiscate the taxes. But is that what you're advocating? Giving uh, a little more freedom for those that want to, want to decline funding? Everyone that we have uh, been working with who have declined the funding have simply stated that it was an incredible freedom. Well, I'm going to put Mike on the spot here and you can tell us your perceptions on the funding and I think that will, will an help answer your question. Like my family, my wife and I, we've never accepted funding for homeschooling and we have, oh, thank you. And we have 11 children and we started homeschooling right from the start so none of our kids have been in school ever and because we have 11 and, you know, and some of them have finished some of them still going, but that means we forfeited you know, thousands of dollars of potential funding and we did that willingly. And Leo just uh, had me come in case uh, this question came up so that I could explain uh, why we don't accept funding in case, uh, you know, that would be interesting for anybody else. I mean, this is just what we choose to do for our family. Um, as many of you, we believe that the father and the mother, they're there to make the decisions for their own family, so I'm not here to tell anybody what they're supposed to do in their family. I'm just explaining what we believe and why we did what we've done. 
Um, we came at this from a perspective, we, we never even really seriously considered the funding. When we started homeschooling, our view was uh, we weren't even going to be registered whatsoever. Like, because we are, are teaching our children from a Christian perspective, and we see the government, <coughs> uh, because they hold a secular humanist perspective, they believe in education from an entirely different perspective. Like all education is done from some philosophical perspective, and ours is Christian, the government's was not Christian, and so we weren't even going to register originally because we didn't, um, like we didn't want, we wanted to make sure that we didn't recognize the government's authority over our children whatsoever. Because if, if uh, the government has a different perspective, which is really ultimately a different religion, we don't want the authorities of another religion um, having uh, you know, over authority over our children's education. So. Um, so at first we were unregistered altogether, and we didn't even think about the funding. Um, what that changed a little bit because uh, at the time, um, the first uh, lawyer for HSLDA was a guy named Dallas Miller, and uh, there was a number of unregistered families as well as well as ours. And I knew Dallas, and he was a good guy, and he kind of sympathized with those of us who were unregistered. And I even asked him one time because we were members of HSLDA. I said. Uh, as an unregistered parent, if we were in trouble with the government, would you defend us? And he said yes. Like he didn't hesitate. He was, he had no qualms about that. But what he tried to do, because he understood where, uh, what our perspective was, he tried to work out kind of a compromise deal in a sense. Like not where we compromise our principles, but where we could go maybe part way with the government. So he came up with what was called with uh, a plan called partial compliance. And he and he said, basically what you do with that is you take the form, the registration form, and what you what you can conscientiously provide to the government you put that in and what you can't conscientiously provide you just cross that out and then write a letter <laughs> explaining why you're doing what you're doing and so I thought uh, well you know that kind of um, alleviates my concerns like I can I can really willingly do that because th the reason we were unregistered wasn't because we were anarchists like we believe in Romans 13 that God has instituted the civil government so there is a place for the civil government but God also places restrictions on the power and authority of the civil government and because we're we believe that the parents, well the Bible says that the parents are responsible for education. Uh, that was my wife and I and we were teaching with, from a Christian perspective and we didn't want a secular government to have that authority over, the, over our children's education as I mentioned. But um, with partial compliance, like we, we weren't afraid that the government, of the government knowing that we had kids and we were homeschooling, we weren't ashamed of that, like, we weren't trying to hide anything. So with partial compliance we could tell the government, you know, we have these children and these are their names and this is the education we're using. I just wanted, didn't want to acknowledge the government's authority, that's all. Like, I'm happy to share with the government what we're doing. I just did not want to um, acknowledge their authority. And um, so coming at it from that perspective, we figured that um, if we were saying that to, to the government, we don't accept your authority over the education of our children, it seemed to be a contradiction then to say, I don't recognize your authority, but I want your money. It just, you know, it just contradicts what we were doing. And so right from the start, you know, we haven't accepted um, funding. And, and because we see it as an authority issue, um, it, it, the only way we could conscientiously accept the funding is if, to acknowledge the government's authority and for us that was a contradiction and so we never uh, went along with that and there's um, <coughs> Dallas Miller also at the time he uh, rec actually I got a quote but it, it doesn't really matter but D Dallas was opposed to funding like Dallas wrote in the HSLD newsletters back in those days you know our position I mean he, he, he wasn't um, trying to get rid of funding he wasn't against representing families who took funding his thing was just if you do take the funding you know you got to expect more government regulation and more government intervention in your program, right? So, um, so there were others um, uh, who take that position, and I, I, and I understand there's still other families as well as ours that don't accept funding. So, but again, I say you know it's every uh, family has to make that decision for themselves. But um, this was uh, the reasons that we uh, rejected funding. Questions? You had a question. Did you lose it? <laughs> okay. Now, when you're saying that we should not go out to best to be better than the public education system. Mm -hmm. I guess for me, I want my kids to be best kids at math, reading comprehension. I mean, we should be taken as the first or second Peter, and our conduct in that should be so good that it shames them. And I think, so I'm a little bit, like when you're saying we shouldn't be doing better trying to best them, mm -hmm. I kind of think we should be. <coughs> my objective when I was raising my children was that they would love the Lord, their God, with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. I wrote as much as I could in their hearts that they would serve Him. And we focused on that. That was our focus. That's what the school is not doing. 
And oh, by the way, they all learned to read. They all learned to write. They all learned the math. You could take an entire grade 12 program and do it in less than three years. So, you know, for us to focus on that and to measure by that is the wrong measure. Uh, I can guarantee you when we stand before the Lord, he's not going to give us a still testing math question or, or give us some, some grammar quiz. It, it's going to be, how did you use your talents to serve me? And, and so that's the emphasis. You see, the reason... So the, the, that comes. It is, but that comes as natural. See, we've we've made learning into some kind of a, of something that doesn't start until, uh, you know, tiny tot daycare. You know, where learning starts. Children are learning before they're ever born. You can't stop them from learning. Although I remember in Grand Prairie one time, one lady said you can if you send them to public school, but that was a joke. But you <laughs> you really can't stop children from learning. They will learn. All that the school is doing is providing opportunities for that learning. But the thing is, is that it's not tailored to the individual. It's groupthink. How many people remember what they learned in school? Very few of us. But I'll tell you what we do know. We know what, what we had to learn. I mean, God created us to learn what we have to learn, to do what we have to do when we need to do it. And, and if we don't continue to do that, th that just kind of gets shelved and we keep on going. As an example, a lot of us went through the, the torture of algebra. And, and I remember I, I asked one lady, I asked a, a group in, up in Grand Prairie again actually at the same, same time and I, I said, how many of you, you know, are using your algebra today? And you know, when was the last time you used your algebra? And I remember one lady sticking up her hand, she says, the last time I shoved it down my kids' throats. Okay? The reality is, is that if you look at the school system, it is not based on the premise that we are created unique with gifts and talents and abilities. The parents are the only ones who really truly possess the ability to, to see that and to develop, to help develop, to provide opportunity to develop what God has created. And nowhere in life is it chopped up into little tiny pieces called subjects. It's not, except that in school. Just like when was the last time you found yourself in a room with you know, this many people all the same age doing the same thing at the same time. If you really stop and look at it from the perspective of God's creative power compared to, you know, and, and, and his diversity and compared to man's quest for conformity, you start to see the reason why I'm saying, I don't want any part of this. I, I don't want to conform to the image of man. I want to conform to the image of God, and the only way that I can do that is to celebrate who I am and to be comfortable in my skin. That's what we emphasize in home education. At least that should be what we emphasize in, the, in home education. But if we get all hung up on math and English and social and studies, we can keep them plenty busy. We can. And in the final analysis, they might be able to best them. The question is, why? This isn't a competition. We're not all built the same. We outdo them. Mm -hmm. Done by the time they reach puberty. Seriously? You know, we used to actually have them get ready for post-secondary. Now we just tell them to go challenge the first-year courses. Home education works, not public education. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that, yeah, if we are mimicking that system, we're going to get what they have. I was a public high school teacher. I spent my days um, in, you know, helping children get their diplomas. And then at home, my children were doing the whole thing without any accreditation whatsoever because I did not want them to be numbered among them. And seriously, I think as Christians, we need to really ask ourselves, why are we doing this? If it's going to be some kind of a contest where I, I, I want to just better these guys, who's going to know? When I was in high school, and that's a long time ago, you know, <laughs> when I was in high school, my counselor told me his words, pardon it, but I didn't have a hope in hell of ever going to university. Why? Because he was comparing marks. Okay? What he didn't know is I knew the game. I would get a high school diploma if I got 50, as well as if I got 90. <laughs> Why bother? 
right? I can get the same thing for less money. I mean, we're all that way, aren't we? We're looking for the best deal. So that's the game I played. When I finally did go to university, as an example, that guy motivated me. Like, who was he to tell me that? I ended up with two degrees and working graduate <coughs> stuff in four years with honors. I proved it to that guy. The only thing is I didn't even remember his name. <laughs> okay, well, what was the point? Well, I guess in the end I proved something to myself maybe, but you know, we're not in competition. We're not. And, and, and I think we need to really stop and say, okay, if we're not in competition, then what are we here for? And I think we're here to do the very, very best that we can. I was motivated by my little baby. How many of you remember that one, that first one? Hey, dads, did it scare you half to death? <laughs> I remember making that baby, but boy, when that baby was born, that was a different story. It wasn't fun anymore. <laughs> this was serious business. And I remember looking at that baby and thinking that I would end up being responsible for where that child would be. I asked myself a question, and I've been asking this question all along of everything. Where are you leading me? Where was I leading that child? That's what started all this whole story, and that's why I'm where I am today. The reality is, is that I would answer to God someday for that child. And I'm still learning, as we all are, but I've learned a long time ago that I'm not going to get any points by making them look like Sally or Tom or George that go to school over there, or maybe they've got 88 versus an 87. <laughs> What's the difference? I used to flunk kids and they'd pass anyways. The administration would just give them a passing mark. What does the mark mean? Okay. Mr. Tomlin, I like the idea of the, Go ahead. Of, of the advisory committee or committee, oh but in that committee as well, so we need to redefine everything. We need to redefine parent direct, blended, home education, mm -hmm. so that we have a basis to start off, to start informing mm -hmm. new homeschoolers where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. Right now, we've got a blur oh. of, of yeah. definitions of words. We've found that there's been so many people who started home educating in grade one with the first one, and everything is just home education, and they hit high school, and they drop them into the school. And you wonder, how in the world could they have done that? I mean, first of all, when they're 15 years old, you don't send them to school. You send them to university if they're home educated from the beginning. That, that's, that's true. But why were they doing that? Well, you remember that story that I was talking about? The line? That line was really, really obvious. You're going to be on that side of the line, or you're going to be on that side of the line. The best way to confuse people is to blur that line until people can't understand the difference between one and the other. And that's the reason why these people float back in there, and they take these kids and literally put them back in jail. Okay? And it's because they're, well, you know, we, we compromise a little bit here, and we compromise a little bit there, and a little bit here, and a little bit there, and, and we end up over here, and we wonder how we got there. Well, you've got to remember that the first casualty of compromise is always the truth. Jesus said, we are either going to be for him or we're against him. Okay? And, and really, in the final analysis, that's what really led me to the Christian faith, because I studied my way into it, if you know what I'm saying. I kind of read the Bible and tore it apart and put it back together again and tore it apart and so on. And, and I, what I loved about it is it was that we had a choice between heaven and hell. We had a choice between right and wrong. We had a choice between serving God or serving man. We had a choice between being for him or against him. It was so very, very simple. And the thing is, is that what's happened in the home education community today is that we've blurred that line. That's why we have to ask ourselves, you know, if you're going to be on the school side, that's fine. But understand that you're on the school side. If you're going to be on the home education side, that's okay too. But understand what that is. Because they aren't the same world. And I know when we try to blend these things, it's not blended. Do you remember the article that I wrote? That was called Blended? or mixed up. There's a big difference between blending and mixing up. And really, you can pour a little bit of white paint and a little bit of red paint and you end up with pink. That's blending. But just try to mix oil and water, or rocks and water for that matter. Okay? There, there's, it, it, that's what I find you know, really, really frustrating is that we're not clear on who we are and why we're doing this and and, and what we're prepared to pay for that. And, 
Every one of us would probably lay down our lives for our children. Wouldn't we? That's where it starts. And that's what we're doing. We're laying down a job because one has to stay home if you're going to home educate. Now, I know a lot of us would have been doing that anyways because that's our culture. It's how we live. But still, we're going to make less money. We're going to do less things. And, you know, in lots of ways, we're not going to do as well as the rest. Well, let me tell you another story, if you will. Are you good with stories? When I was teaching, I was a weirdo. I was a publicly declared Christian. My wife was staying at home. We were home educating, and I'm a public <coughs> high school teacher. Lots and lots and lots of opportunities to de- hone my debating skills. And he was working, and she was working, and they had their cottage at the lake, and they had their motor home, and they had their, their ORV, and I was living in some little trailer down a dirt road with my kids, and they laughed at me, and they called me the loser and everything else. Their kids were in public school because they were both busy making money. In the final analysis, though, their motor home wore out. The house at the cottage, it, it fell down. The ORV is long gone. And so is their family. I've got mine today. And you know what? If I wanted to, I could still have a motor home. I could still get a cottage by the lake. And I could still get that ORV. But I've got my family. Because I know what I wrote in their hearts. I was there every day. I didn't care what the government had to say. I knew what they had to say. So, you know, call me a hypocrite or two-faced or whatever. But I knew what I had to write in my children's heart to make them different from the rest of the world. So, you know, that, that's, that's the choice that we have. You know, are we going to be really, truly home educating? Or are we going to be sending them to school? Because there is a line down the middle. And it is quite different. It, it, the, the, it's not the same. The, it is right or wrong or, if you will, black and white or, or, or you know, heaven or hell or whatever the case may be. That, that, that's how I see it. And when I look in the scripture, that's how I see it as well. There's very little room for relativity. You know, I st- you know uh, Greg Coco said, you know, like, feet firmly planted in midair. Okay? We, we, we need to uh, ask ourselves, why am I doing this? So there's, there's two things we always need to ask. Whenever we're looking at any structure or evaluating, whether it's talking about, you know, the home education providers or, or a here or anything else, and the first question is, what is the motivation? What, what are we there for? What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Ask that question. Then, once you get that established, you point some, you know, you, 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 you put some lines and you put an arrow because that's going to tell you where you are going. Fathers, you're the leader of your family. The question is, where are you leading them? That's what motivated me with my little child. Where was I going to lead this child? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. It's critical. It really is. Because as long as we're sitting there and we're saying, oh, well, you know, it's like, a, like the pizza pie, right? <laughs> we talked about the pizza pie. We had, we had pizza for supper. And you know, uh, what, what was that one called with all the meat? It was called uh, something or other. Meat lovers. Let's just call it meat lovers. And you know what? All of it was meat lovers. All of it. If I took a piece out of this corner, it's meat lovers. Still pizza. If I took it out of this corner, it's still pizza. If I took it out of this corner, it's still pizza. And so on. It's pizza, right? Sometimes in our lives, what we do is we compartmentalize our whole lives. And we say, well, there's God box over here, and then there's another box called education, and another box over here called, you know, politics, and another box over here, and we separate it all. I don't believe that that's, that's God. He's, he's not in scattered all abroad. He's, he's doesn't matter what part of society or whatever that we do. It's still part of that piece. It's still part of God. And in the end... It really is a question of faith, isn't it? It's a question of faith in such a way that um, we need to ask ourselves why the Lord said, when I return, will I find faith on earth? What does that mean? Will I find faith on earth? It is a question of faith. And we have to make our minds as to what we are going to do and how we're going to do this. And if we go back to where we come from. Then we can reevaluate and we can take a look at where the greater home education community is headed. Is it possible that the home education community divides? Mm-hmm. 
I wouldn't want to see it. We weren't too divided in the beginning because we needed each other. There was only a handful of us. We, we, had, we, we, we really needed to have one another. But I'll tell you what divided that original community. And it's still what's dividing our community today. And I'm going to go back to the funding. It divided us. It divided us along all kinds of different lines. And it actually ruined some relationships and friendships, which is what matters in the end. That's all that matters. A relationship with God, with our wives, with our children, with each other. Nothing else matters. So again, back to that. Questions? Uh, well, just another comment. Yeah, we already had part of a divide for four, five years ago with the blended community, but we never learned a lesson from that. I don't think. Basically, we're now five years mm -hmm. later doing the same thing again. My dad was part of World War II, and um, I remember him saying something that really, really shocked me. But they went to World War II because they were fighting evil. And when they, they, they beat evil, and they came back home, and they thought that evil was beaten, and evil came back home with them and just grew. And Dad said, you know, I can't believe the very things I went to war to fight against are now part of our society. Okay? That's what happens. We forget very, very quickly. Because what happens, we figured, aha, we got that battle. Good. Hey, wait a minute. That battle was a symptom. What caused that battle in the first place? Is if we don't fix that problem, we're going to see it all over again. It's going to rear its head. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, okay. Yes. It's not just education. No. And this is where Wayne said this morning, our lives are to serve God and our neighbors. And if everybody came at education from that point, there would be no problem. But we're all fallen humans. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say there were no problems. There'd be a whole different set of problems. We'd have to solve something else because life is problems. You know, we, we, that's it. But how do you, I mean, education is also just it, one of the things. Very, very important, yeah. And it's not even education. Because, you, you know, the word doesn't actually, it's not found in the Bible. It's, it's training and it's teaching. Okay, there's, there's those two words that are in there. Personally, I think the training is pre-puberty and it might require a few little you know, corrections. And the, tr the teaching is post-puberty. And it, it really doesn't take all that much time. But we do the education portion and the industry. Well, the industry I'd sure like to see go because, of course, I've seen it go that way too many times. But the thing is, is that, again, if we focus on the teaching and the training of the children, the math and the English and the social and the science, I mean, how in the world can you read the Bible and not see this stuff in there? As an example, now I'm, I'm not advocating this, but I don't know if you've all heard the story about that one girl that was, uh, that was uh, uh, abducted by her dad and they were in the bush for, I don't know, eight years or something. And all they had was uh, the Bible. And I think they had a world book, didn't they? Encyclopedia, Faye? Do you remember? Maybe, yeah. Just a couple of, yeah. So they, they finally found them, you know, after all these years. And they bring them home and they decided to test the girl, figuring, boy, here's this girl who's 13 years old and she's probably going to be working at a grade 2 level. And she was like grade 16. Okay. How, how did that happen? She didn't take any math, didn't take any English, didn't take any social. She just lived life, read the Bible maybe a dictionary or whatever else. They had something else. I'm not sure what it was, but I know that the Bible was the one that caught my ear. They, she had, that's all she had to read. So she learned to read reading the Bible. Do you know how school started? <coughs> started on Sunday. <laughs> and it was called what? Sunday school. And the objective was to teach your children to be literate so they could read the Bible. Did you know that in the United States, before they implemented compulsory education, they had a 96% literacy rate? And since compulsory education, they've never seen that level of literacy. You know, there's two ways of thinking. There's God's way and then there's man's way. And you can't use man's way to please God anymore, and Brian knows this, than you can take God's way to please man. I mean, that, that doesn't work. Okay, they, they are separate. Yeah. So, so you know, I mean, a lot of these, there's much more discussion to be made on a lot of these issues. Back to the funding, okay. And I, 
We know that politically there's some that would just want to confiscate the taxes and that's it. And, and you know, Christians pay taxes, but we become second, third class citizens in our own country and second, third class students, different funding rate for this one, that one. There needs to be rough reforms all that way. So if we just lose the funding battle or even just forfeit the funding. So what's the default position? We get a tax rate off on our income tax? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would like to see that. Personally, I, you know, that's how it should work. That's how it works in some jurisdictions, actually, uh, not here. And of course, the reality is, is that if you do that, then what you're doing is empowering the, the parents. Is government concerned about money or power? Power is what motivates them. Control. Yeah, power and control. So, you know, how do we answer that? Well, maybe I can answer it this way. And again, you and I have a lot of this. We're still duking it out. We've. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and when we don't, it's almost always Brian that's wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but these are good discussions. Yes. And, and there needs to be an advisory committee yeah. to, to, to collect this. To Carrying on with what you were saying there, you know, there, there is two paradigms. And, and, and I think maybe essentially that's what I'm saying, and I don't know if everyone can follow me here, but there is a paradigm called the temporal. That's the here and now, that's where we're living. That involves the taxes and the money and what's fair and what's not fair and everything else. But really, when we gave our hearts to the Lord, He opened our eyes to something far bigger than the temporal, far bigger than the here and now. He opened our eyes to the eternal. And so in the eternal realm, I don't have to worry. He said He'd provide, and He does. He said He would guide, and He does. Whatever he said he would do, he does. That's, that's the thing. But it's, it's a far greater vision. You see, the thing is, is if I have an eternal vision, I can see into the future. I can see eternity. But if I'm focused on anything else, be it a, a dollar or be it power or be it whatever, I am limited in my vision because I'm focusing on this. My eternity is gone. My temporal has taken over. It, it's that simple. So we ask ourselves, are we focused on the eternal? In the grand scheme of things, what matters? First, it's a whole lot easier for me because I've tried a whole bunch of stuff and realized it ain't worth it. <laughs> Don't go there. Okay? And that's maybe we're part of it too. And I'm going to really step out here into a pie, and I might get into even more debating with, with Brian over this later on. But the reality is, is that we, we talked about sometimes we're just ignorant. We can be ignorant regarding school, what school is and what school isn't, and, and, and so on. That's why, you know, on one side of the, of, the, of, of, of the fence, if you can say, if we've got this line and on one side it's evil and on one side it's good, if I put school on one side, what do you put on the other side? Unschool, <laughs> right? S seriously, I mean, I, I, people say, how do you home educate? Well, just take a look at school and don't do that. I think that's probably the best way that I can describe that. <laughs> I told you we'd have a debate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't want government intrusion, right. government taking away parental mm -hmm. authority. And at, at some point, we become the age majority. We, we've got to grow up one day, right? Yeah. And get married. Up. And then in the working in the world, there's professions, okay? In, in, there's accreditation. So you've got to transition to that at some point, okay? Would you like your, uh, I got to fly west yet this summer down east to my parents' cottage on the ocean. And we're looking forward to that. But I want to make sure that that pilot's qualified to fly that airplane, okay? So we're not totally against accreditation and uh, certification, but in the K to 12 years, you've got to be so careful. You don't want the government intruding into our families, okay? And then when you get into the post-secondary or the vocational thing, it's a different world. You need qualifications in, in, the, in the marketplace, okay? I think that's part of it. I think you're talking about two different things. We didn't go there yet. There's a whole accreditation versus education. These are, these are two different topics. All right. Accreditation, I want my plumber to know that water grows downhill. All right. Yeah, and I, and I, I do want my mechanic to know, you know how to fix a car. I do. However, let's be careful here. I know of fully qualified mechanics that I wouldn't even give them my wheelbarrow. And there are plumbers that still don't know that water flows downhill. Okay, accreditation is an altogether different thing. And you have to remember that when we reach out for accreditation, we're looking for approval from man. Okay? 
we are. Now, in all fairness, it's the world that we happen to live in. It's the temporal world we happen to be in. But I want my children to be accredited by God. I want him, them to be affirmed by God. I want them to, to be serving him. Okay? That, that, I think that, again, that's my motivation. That's my objective. That's what I want to do. That's not to disqualify the fact that we live in this world and we have to do certain things in order to be able to be successful. All right? You folks are videographers. Do you have any big piece of paper that says you're a videographer? Oh, are you sure you're a videographer then? Okay. Really, in the end, I don't care if you got a journeyman certificate. Can you fix my car? That, that's what matters. Unfortunately, <laughs> if you're going to work and make money, you better have your certificate. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a whole different story. Now, just to quickly answer that, we have never in all the years that we have been working in home education since the beginning, we have never done any accreditation of any kind with anybody ever. And we have had no problems getting them into the post-secondary institution because I happen to believe that if God created them to be a mechanic, they end up being a mechanic. If God did not give them math ability, forget about them going into engineering, all right? And if they have writing as lousy as mine, they're not going into journalism, okay? It's simple as that. So we help our students to build their strengths and we still have to help them to manage their weaknesses. So if math is just not their thing, we still need to help them to live in this world. They need to balance their checkbook. They need to know what, what mortgage is and what interest is and so on and so forth. Those are the things that matter. Yeah. So, from what <coughs> I hear you say, homeschooling is good, school is bad, black, white. Is that correct? I'm saying that if I have a choice, rather than put my children in a secular, godless, unbiblical, anti-Christian program, or any facsimile thereof, I am going to choose to put them in a system where we can emphasize God as the focus and not men. Okay, so but so we have schools that emphasize God but are a school system. Mm -hmm. And then we have home schools where, mm -hmm. and I totally agree with you, um, our philosophy has always been it's about our children and above all else it's about their faith. Mm -hmm. And if you can instill their faith in them and teach them look to God for where he wants to use them, they can't fail. Correct. Right? Okay. So, again, so that's, that's me and, and we all have that. I, I'm trying to get an handle on your position though. Like, homeschooling is good, school of any kind is bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, homeschooling is definitely good. As a matter of fact, I'm even going to... I. I, I, I dislike school so much, I'm going to say home education <laughs> is, or home training is a whole lot better than, than school, all right? And so people would ask me, does that mean that you think everybody should home educate? Okay, can I answer it that way? And I would say, yes, absolutely. However, caveat, not everybody can. Not everybody can. So we have here an alternative for those that can't, or for those that won't. Because you know every excuse I've ever heard against home education starts with the word I. Okay? So there's the can'ts and the won'ts. We'll be going to school with the ones that can't over there. But let's for a moment paint ourselves into a perfect Christian society. Doesn't exist, certainly not in Alberta or Canada right now, but let's, let's just pretend for a minute. And let's say, for the sake of argument, 80% of the people can and should home educate. Now that leaves 20% of the people that can't. How do you, what do you do with them? Well, in that perfect Christian world, the ones that can should be helping the ones that can't. So in my world, you're asking, you know, does school exist? Well, in the temporal world, yeah, you bet it's there. <laughs> I made my living at it for 25 years. Sure. But on the other hand, if we were living the way God has instructed us to live, we would all be helping one another. And remember, not everybody is going to be a men's IQ. Not everybody's a rocket scientist. Not everybody's a musician. 
Okay? On this side, it's based on the school side. It's based on the premise that these children are accidental, cosmic freak, evolutionary accidents. And the entire system is based on that ideology. The breaking it up into subjects and the breaking it up into <laughs> hour-long periods. Can you just see yourself, Mom? You're cooking dinner. So, oh, it's 1 o'clock. And you just drop it because for the next hour, you're going to be doing laundry. And then you drop it, and for the next hour, you're going to be doing house cleaning, you know? And it's all going by a little bell. I mean, these are dis this is dysfunctional. You understand what I'm saying? So, yeah, you're asking me, am I falling hard on this side? Mm-hmm, I am. But reality still dictates there's a place for school in this world because we're here. It's not my first choice. Okay? And I'm totally on side with you. Mm-hmm. I find it challenging how you are kind of going at it in terms of, I would put it in terms of faith. God tells me to live it out mm -hmm. and to be an example. Yep. And I think you shared earlier on that we all have our own perceptions of what's right and how to do it. Right. And I know mine's broken. Yeah. Like, we don't realize we're broken. I realize yeah. I'm broken. Yeah. And I know it's more than I realize. Mm -hmm. So all I can do is live out and um, you know in the home education world we all fight battles and you know it's always been a battle like your kids you're going to ruin them right um, I have three that are done high school uh, number four is already started on her post secondary not graduated um, but the less I said and the more they witnessed to the world around them was better. Just like in my faith. If I try and shove it down people and say, this is, I'm right, you're wrong, you, you hit a wall. For they, sure. They close. Yeah. So, you know, I'm totally on side with you. And, I, you know, you asked the definition of home, home education. Home, it's already written. There is, is it not in Alberta? Yes, there's a homeschool policy, which that is home education. It doesn't include blended or um, aligned. Yeah. Right? So it's already defined. Well, it is. It is. But you know what? I'm not interested in how the government defines it. What I'm saying is that I'm interested in how God defines it. So again, you got to remember that all we can do, like you might, I, <laughs> I used to take in school, I used to take out the book and I say, here, this is the stuff that you've got to learn. This is it. It says, and I got to tell you something. It says, I can't shove this thing down your throat. And I said, and if I could somehow I'll give you a pill and you learn it so you can barf up the information on the exam, I'd be rich and you'd be happy. Okay? All I can do is provide you with the opportunity. We as Christians are messengers. We are ambassadors for Christ. Our job is to, bit, is to witness the best of our ability based on the understanding that we have. It's not to convict anyone or to convince anyone. Our job is to simply present the information, and whether that's in word or in deed, and it's the job of the Holy Spirit and the job of the people to consider what has been said and, and make it work or not. But the reality is, is that we're not being challenged. You know, I was going to say this earlier. The problem is, is that what we're looking at is we're looking at the home education as though it's an isolated problem, but it's not. It's a problem that's endemic to the entire Christian church. I hate to say that. The Christian church has been divided along all kinds of lines as well. And there's all kinds of people on one side of the fence and on the other. Last I read, and this is a, from a real good source, it's from the Wikipedia. They said that there were 42,000 denominations on earth. How many Christs are there? How many gods are there? You know. So from my, from my perspective, yeah. that's not a bad thing, and this is why, because again, we don't all have the same picture understanding, and none of us has it right. Mm -hmm. So if we have different groups that see it slightly different, but can get along and not fight over it, focus on what on what Correct. we have in common. Yes, and let those people witness to a different group that I can reach, right. and that <coughs> it, right. it's actually not a bad thing. Like, sometimes I think we talk about it, that it's a bad thing to have all these denominations. 
Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I think we need to not focus on our differences, but our commonalities. I agree. And that's the problem. We don't know what that commonality is. So that's the point we're saying. We need to go back and ask ourselves, why are we doing this? What's the objective? In the beginning, I forget what your name is, but he asked, what was the difference? We, we all knew what we were doing back then, and th th there was no argument. Okay, we, we had a common purpose, we had a common goal, a common motivation, and a common enemy. And that common enemy at that point in time was the government. All right, over the, last, over the course of the last 30 years, has the government improved? Or do you think it's even more anti what we're doing? I mean, that's, that's the thing. So we, you know, we, we were focusing on those common things. Now, did that mean that we all went to the same church and all used the same curriculum and all wore the same clothes? Well, besides a denim jumper, uh, <laughs> you know, no, no, okay? Um, we, we were all different, and that's what we want to do. We want to celebrate God's diversity, but, but God didn't give us a diverse um, uh, picture of himself. He, he's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, there, there has to be, in the final analysis, if you stop and think of it, all 42,000 denominations, if they're all right, if they're all end up in there, there's a lot of reconciliations it's going to take. It's going to take us an eternity <laughs> just to get it all fixed up. You know, there is only, the way I look at it, it says, you know, behold, the Lord thy God is one God, okay? And I shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, there's one God. And I hope that that's the foundation that we can, we can build on. And there is one Christ. And that's a foundation that we can build on. And when we start on that foundation, and we can start talking about what home education is and isn't, it's going to come up a whole lot different than if we sit there and we normalize, if you will, everybody as starting on the right. Because that's what's happened in the world today to the point that the people who disagree with you, rather than sit down and have an intelligent dialogue, will call you names. Okay? So that's what happens when you have this divergence of idea and everybody's idea is right. That, incidentally, is called relativism. Well, I think, you know, you've got to be careful. This is where I think it's in uh, Amos, maybe, you know, to use discern discernment, judgment. And there are some issues here that are being offered to idols. And, you know, you're pretty hardcore on some things. Oh, yeah. But I would say... We get all fired up about grade K to 12, but then you go and get two degrees from university. Well, that's a capstone of the system. You it is. Yeah, and I got there before I even so got saved. But to me, <laughs> if I look at that, what's the difference? If we so hate the world, yeah. why would we go to its university? We are, my, my position yeah. is, as the comments I've made, I think this is for all of us, because I'm training my kids to be Jews in Egypt. To be what? Jews in uh huh. That's what I say for myself at work. I'm a Jew in Egypt. I got to be the best guy at my job. So I think you're at more at war with the money behind the industry, or and that was my second question we didn't get to. Do you have a problem with these different vendors? Like, say they didn't do it for the love of money. Well, let's and ask. They, everybody's got. I go to my job for yeah. money. Right, I mean, right. I love my job. Sure. The people I work yeah. with. At the end of the day, I got mortgage to pay. Mm hmm. With money? With the, the fact that some of these vendors love the money more, or is it the system that's been set up? Uh, I mean, we need a system. We need a system. But first, I want to correct you. I'm not at war with anything. I, you know, I, we war not against flesh and blood, the powers of principality of the heavenly you know, uh, realm. Okay. What, okay? what, I'm, what I'm at issue with see, is, um, is not the money, but how the money is being used. As an example, if home education was not funded, if there was no funding for home education, how would a heel look? How would that exhibit hall look? Just questions. Just saying. Okay? So, you, so you're not, you don't have a problem with the different vendors, what we can go and buy? No, that's, that's not my, that's not my, my you know, my, <laughs> my issue is, do we know who we are? So I'll just look at your first premise. Are we doing it? Glorify the Lord to educate or to train up our children. Mm -hmm. That's the main focus. That's the main focus. Once we get that sorted out, then we can deal with these other things. Thanks for coming. I think there's a whole variance. That's the problem is, is in, as in all of life, you go to a church, you have Christians 
that are new in the middle mm -hmm. at the end. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I come to the IHEA convention to talk to new people, to people part way on the way, mm -hmm. to share what I believe is, well, what is my conviction for my kids and what I believe should be theirs, mm -hmm. um, and to encourage them in that. I, Fellowship is fine. I mean, and I don't know why we're going here because I never said anything about that. I just said, I just, like the lady I talked to today who's starting to homeschool, I said, understand, don't sweat the details. Mm -hmm. It's relationship with your kid, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's the only way I can see that I can impact people is by living that out, sharing what I've gone through, um, you know, and one-on-one, -on -one, keeping that. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that we do have, I mean, the people I know are not doing it for the money or anything else. Um, we talk about the faith of our, of our mm -hmm. children. And we, we, we make the assumption that they're not, and I'm not saying that they are. I'm just saying that sometimes maybe we project how we feel on other people. Obviously, if they agree with me, well, then we must all think the same way. That's not the case. Everyone has different ways of, of approaching it. This isn't, I said when we started off, this is not a vendetta against anything else. It's just a sort of a call to action. And the action is, let's ask ourselves who we are. Let's ask ourselves why we started this. Let's ask ourselves where it is we want to go. Because if we're not steering this ship, who is? Absolutely. Every day I get up, my prayer mm -hmm. is God use me the way you want today. Yeah. We are getting very close to the end of the evening and I'm running out of steam. Actually, I'm really steamed. <laughs> it's quite warm. Uh, we have to be out of here by uh, pretty quick here in just a few minutes. So are there any other uh, questions before we call her quits for the night? I hope we were successful tonight in doing nothing more than to cause us to question. That's it. That's all I want. And what do I want? What, what, what am I hoping you're going to question? Everything. We have to be questioning everything all the time. The minute that we think that we've got the corner on the truth, we just made a mistake. Okay? Nobody had that corner. We need to question what it is that we're doing, and we need to question the motivation behind the industry, we need to question the motivated motivation behind some who are playing with the industry. Why would they want to be there? Why would they want to do this? What's the objective? We do need to question that. Because if we don't, we are actually empowering them. Okay? To turn around and to not stand up against the government like what Brian did is to validate their claim to having that authority. Okay? We actually need to sometimes stand up, back to the old taxi thing. We need to right or wrong. If there's some things that aren't right, it's not good enough for us to say, well, I've only got two more kids, you know, I'm finished anyways, what's the difference? My former principal, not this guy, well, but the one that in the school that I was in before, we were at during the, the, uh, the New Education Act debates. And I asked him, I said, where do you think this is all going? His response and his words, I don't really care, I'm retiring in two years. Okay? Yeah. Okay? So if you wonder why, I sometimes wonder, where are we going? What's going on? I hear this stuff, and I'm seeing things, of course, that most people don't see. But, there, you know, how much power do I have to change that? None. But we all have a Christian obligation to help our brothers and sisters. And if it's nothing more, just ask a question. Do you know what you're doing? Where are you leading me? Why are you getting involved? What's your purpose? What's your motivation? We can start asking questions. And when we start asking questions, you'd be amazed at how many times you just don't get an answer. Okay? Yeah. Or, yeah, well, most of the time you're surprised because there is no answer. You know, they haven't thought about it. I mean, I, many, many times I've asked leaders where they're leading me, and they go, oh, um, but yeah, you're sure. You know, Boy, it's sure been warm out, hasn't it? You know? They, and unless we truly know that, then, then we can't pretend to be in leadership positions, and a lot of us are in leadership positions. We had better know because the scripture is pretty straight about that. We're, we're going to answer for that. Thank you very much, everyone. God bless you, and uh, 
pray for home education in this province. I think it really does need a lot of prayer. And if you've learned something this evening, pass it on. That's what we're supposed to be doing. All right, good night. Thank you.